All right, it is game week for Pirate Baseball ECU getting underway their 2024 baseball season Friday. Four o'clock, Ryder will be in town for a three-game series. Friday at four, Saturday at two, and Sunday at one o'clock. And here to preview the season is the head baseball coach of the Pirates, Cliff Godwin, joining us in the Pirate Radio studios. Coach, appreciate your time here on game week. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Cliff. What's the uh, the the feelings like for you? You put in all this work with the team this off season, and now they get to go out on the field and uh, display everything that they've learned, everything they've done their entire lives on the baseball field. Is it a, a excitement, nervousness? How do you describe kind of opening week for you? Well, I think every year is a little bit different. Uh, I've told our players that we've been able to get outside so much uh, in this preseason. We have everything in. We've repped it out. We've competed at a high level. I mean, this past weekend, the scrimmages were all – one run games all three scrimmages and super competitive i don't know if i've ever been at a place where it was so competitive the guys were into it uh we wore game uniforms this weekend to kind of get them in that feel and that helps but um our guys are ready obviously we got some practice to get in this week just to refresh uh some things and do some pickoffs and bunt d's and stuff and we'll actually scrimmage for three innings tomorrow to just get some relievers back on the mound and um get some some guys some more live at bats but really uh the hay's kind of in the barn and uh we're just going to rip out some things and get ready for friday yeah I, I was able to get to one of the scrimmages last sunday and uh one thing i noticed coach just the the execution of your team before every half inning uh or i guess every half inning you're you're butting a guy over first guy and i think every bunt got down i know you had to be proud of that but just uh it seemed very crisp out there there was some balls that got kicked around here or there but i think for the most part everything looked very fluid for you guys you feel that way yeah i do um and I, i've said this a lot i mean we're as deep as we've ever been positionally so when you split teams up it's not like man you can even put what you would feel like would be the starting nine on one side and that other team's still very good so um our guys if like i said have done a really good job and they're prepared and they're ready to go and uh, we just need to get these uh these practices in and lift weights a couple more times and be ready to rock and roll on friday yeah and you, you mentioned some of the things you want to do this week and, and leading up to the game it, it it seems like it will be impossible to put your team in every single situation before they see it in the game but you try to do that right so uh, how much are you able how many times are you in a game and think man we did not prepare for this moment <laughs> it can't be a lot right no um i can probably count those times on my hand Right. Uh, as being the head coach, I know before the pitch out rule was changed, uh, Chris Hole will probably uh, kill me for saying this, but in 17, we tried to intentionally walk out a guy, walk a guy at Ole Miss, and he threw the ball to the backstop with a guy at third base, and uh, I looked at Dan Rosell and I go that's on us man like we haven't like repped it out and so um i know that seems pretty simple that you right. should be able to do that but we hadn't repped it out so that's on us and uh you know th- those were one of the learning a uh, lessons you have expensive learning lessons when you <laughs> lose a game because of it but no our guys we we ch- we really try to put them in really, really tense, pressure-packed situations, especially in inter-squads. And that was one thing we've done past two weekends is put some younger guys in situations to have to close out the game. And, uh, for instance, Jackson Lorenzo has really done a good job in the spring preseason where in the fall – he looked like a freshman. It was, you know, uh, the body language, the – if it didn't go well, um, you know, you could just see that it was weighing on him. Now he looks like an older guy, so that's just a positive thing for us to, to create more depth in that bullpen. I want to run down uh, some of the personnel, but if folks have a question for Cliff, you can get in on Facebook, uh, YouTube, or X. And i uh, got a few questions coming in here. And uh, Sarah says, I see a lot of teams playing alumni games uh, this past weekend. Is that something you could see down the road? How about an alumni games, Coach? Well, right. Betty Burleson has been kind of on me that she's like the ringleader of like the Matt Bridges, Sam Lanier, uh, Cam Cole yeah. or group. Uh, and it's such as you know you only have three weekends that you can scrimmage in reality going in so it's not like a long spring training that you have right. in major league baseball i'm not saying that it will never happen i think i would rather do alumni game in the fall than right. in the spring so but that'd it's be a, a great of, event too to, yeah. get, to get people out to the park 
So. But it's a lot more work than people think. And you got camps you got to do. You got official visit weekend you got to do. So it's a lot. But uh, I'm not saying I'm just going to put Betty Burleson in charge of it and <laughs> let her uh, figure out when we can do it. How uh, how has it changed, Coach, since you played to now with the time you get with the players? Do you get less time now, or is it pretty similar to when you played? What do you remember about it? It's not quite as much time. I mean, the, the, the rules of compliance have changed a whole lot. Yeah. And, um, I would say our guys spend a lot of time up at our facility and doing the stuff optionally, whether it be lifting. But our guys are pretty self-motivated to understand that, look, individually we're trying to um, – be the best version of ourselves, but for a lot of guys, they want to play professional baseball. But also, as a collective unit, we're trying to win a national championship. So you have to do stuff that's extra. You can't just show up during practice and think that's going to be enough. And just talking to your players, I say this to you all the time uh, Danny, Jake, Wyatt, Jacob, uh, who am I forgetting? Parker. Uh, Ryan, just uh, great guys that you bring in here to the program. Uh, they have not said anything to embarrass you or the program, and uh, I, I try not to steer them that way anyway, thanks, Coach. Clip. But thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks, Clip. I appreciate it. <laughs> they, uh, they're great representation uh, of the, the team, and, and they talk about how much work they get in on their own, individual work. And uh, I, I know the results hadn't been on the field yet. You haven't played a game yet, but you're, you got to already be proud of these guys, right? I continue to say this, and I hope our guys don't get comfortable, but their uh, discipline to showing up in the preseason and preparing and the attention to detail. And after a scrimmage one day, Carter Cunningham looking at the group and going, hey, the, the Tuesday-Wednesday practices are important because today we're messing up bunt defenses and pickoffs. And look, that's going to cost us. And that could be de- depend- that could be the difference in us hosting a regional or not hosting a regional or not hosting a super regional. And when you have leadership like that and guys are speaking up in front of the team, it carries a a lot more weight so i've been super proud of this group some of this uh, stood out from that sunday scrimmage uh you had your uh your young catcher walker in uh what's the last name I'm baron sorry. Walker yeah walker baron, baron. yeah uh runners first and second bunt goes down he makes the play to third runner is safe and uh that that allowed jeff palumbo to do some in-game coaching there and say Walker, most guys, you're going to get there, um, know your runners, know the situation, and and those little learning experiences for for young guys like that will really pay dividends when you're in a game situation. But I thought that was pretty cool. You guys are playing it as close to a real game as you can, but also those teaching moments are, are always out there for the guys. Well, it was Riley Johnson running. It was uh, Riley got a great read. He's one of the best base runners, stealers in the country. Um, and it's bang, bang, but he's safe. And we always talk about staying out of the big inning. Well, that's how you allow the big inning because you don't get out. They're giving you an out and we don't get an out and this is our philosophy on defense we always want to eliminate the free 90s and play safe where offensively we're always trying to push the envelope now not run into outs but we're aggressive and if we're going to make a mistake it's going to be an aggressive mistake but yeah that was a great teaching moment for walker for sure and uh, we've seen on the flip side offensively like you talk about that's how east carolina creates those big innings y'all are a big inning team last year kind of go a few without a run and then hit five or seven in a run and i know you want it more consistent but uh you guys had a lot of big innings last year to the point of where you felt like offensively we were stagnant for six innings and you know you think about the north carolina games those two games yeah. and north carolina really outplayed us for i think all but two innings so we played 18 innings. I think they were better than us for 16 out of the 18 <laughs> innings, but we just put up a crooked number and, yep. and won those two games. So I think this year, this group offensively, we got a chance to be super dynamic. We got guys that can run. We got guys that can hit the ball in the gap and out of the yard. Uh, we got skill guys who can steal bases that bunt. I think we got a chance to put pressure on the opposing team one through nine at a very high level. How has uh, Henry Lorty helped with that, Coach? What has he brought to the program? Henry's just bought, brought really a lot of knowledge about hitting specifically. Of course, Pack is you know working in the cages with our guys as well. But Henry just has a great way about himself. He's super approachable. Uh, I know he said on the radio that he learned from one of his mentors that you know to be a great coach you have to be accessible, and he's super accessible to our guys. He can be in the cages at any hour of the day, uh, which I appreciate. And he's super invested into our guys, and they communicate a whole lot. 
lot about um, you know what they're feeling, what they're seeing, all those good things. But he's been a tremendous asset to our program. And you mentioned Pack as well. Him uh, being just a fantastic hitter here at East Carolina, and uh, can still relate to the guys at his age. But what is uh, what's Brian Packard brought as a coach for this team so far? Well, of course, he brings comedy. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely brought. Uh, you know the sense of humor to the uh, to the office and uh, in a good way. Um, but I've said this a lot. I mean, he knew as a player uh, when to joke, when to lock in, and we always talk with our players: uh, have personality, don't be a clown because clowns are distracting. I was going to bring up the word clown. <laughs> I knew you were going to say clown. Well, and uh, I've always used that because you see a clown man like you're you're distracted you're you're watching the clown so but if you have personality then people are engaged but then they can dial back in but he uh and then he's brought like a guy that was played at the highest level here at east carolina all american team usa um player of the year in the conference played professional baseball uh played here so he gets me (laughs) um he knows um you know if i'm getting on a guy that's not personal it's because i love him and i expect more out of him and he just helps out with a lot of stuff behind the scenes and his personality is great uh, speaking of personalities, Coach, I, I've asked the guys, you know, how much – I asked them about that Palumbo experience that we saw at the scrimmage. I said, if there's no crowd in the stands, is that handled any different? Are there more four-letter words or things like that? They said, no, nah, not really. I mean, that's – you guys kind of certainly treat them with respect. Ha- have you yourself maybe tampered down on that over the years? Are you are you still the same coach you were when you first got here I'm years not, ago? I'm not the same coach that I was when I got here. Kids aren't the same either. So, I mean, True. I've had to learn how to – navigate that more but um i've learned to take the emotion out of it um and just talk to them like well this is a standard and we didn't meet the standard whatever the standard may be in that situation but um i don't ever i've never been like this as a coach and i think it's it's a good way to handle things but during the game nobody's trying to strike out nobody's trying to make an error nobody's trying to give up the home run so it's never been me yelling at them because that happens now if we weren't mentally in a good headspace or we weren't you know preparing at the level that we needed to that's when i would at times lose my temper i guess you could say but now um and our assistant coaches are so great that they sometimes say the stuff before i even get it out of my mouth which i like because (laughs) i'm always seen as the ceo the guy that makes the final decision so if it comes from the assistants more at times it's more receptive by the player yeah, and even your guys have said, hey, look, you'll see it. If Cliff gets mad during a game, it's not at us. It's uh, it's usually at the, 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 umpire. the umpires, <laughs> which, by the way, uh, I, I said the line too high, the line, yeah. but over, what did I say, three, two, you two said and a half. Two, two and a half, and you picked the over. Yeah, we're going over two and a half ejections for Cliff Godwin this year. <laughs> He's taking the under. You said you won't get thrown out more than one game. Last year... It's kind of unfair. You had to look out for one of your players, but you got ejected after a game, which shouldn't yeah, even that, be a thing. That <laughs> was uh, that was actually impressive because I was n- I got thrown out by the umpire that I wasn't even talking to, which that was a first. So um, that was looking back on it very comical, but it, it just amazes me at times. Uh, just you know. I feel like you can let stuff go as umpire. Like, game's over. Right. I know Moylan drew a line, but, hey, he's walking the other way. You should be walking the other, the opposite direction. Like, we shouldn't have our antennas up. Like, it's a one-run game. Time runs at second base. It's a three – well, it was a 3-2 count, and he rang him up. I didn't know if it was a strike or not. And to this day, I didn't even go back and look. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> does, yeah. Right. Game's um, over. The game's over. So, um, but, yeah, that was uh, very interesting because, obviously, I was suspended for a game so i don't want to be in that situation again and again it's only the the just what two last year it doesn't really ever happen at all but when you have those moments you guys have an umpires meeting before every game you guys talk and everything are those moments ever brought up or do you just kind of forget about them move on like how does that work yeah i would say uh they're they're probably not the most receptive at that home plate meeting if i had something to say so i normally just keep my mouth shut talk about the ground rules and (laughs) hey how you guys doing the weather's nice outside smile and run back to the dugout (laughs) hey cliff does talk about the weather when uh when hey just when it's nice outside hey the weather looks great for this weekend so you can talk about that clip good deal good deal looking forward to some great crowds and uh gotta be cool for you guys to to see fans at the scrimmages and things like that they're putting the atmosphere out there for you guys clip i can tell 
tell you that this has been the most fans that we've ever had in preseason scrimmages. Uh, Saturday, I, of course, I don't have like a counter, but there's probably over 300 people out there at the scrimmage this past Saturday. And then even Sunday, we were going a little bit earlier because of the rain. I would say there was over 100 there at 11 a.m. And um, you just see them scatter, starts drizzling. And they're going all underneath the overhang. But it, it's been really impressive to see the, the support that our fans have had even before the real games have started. Awesome stuff. Uh, question from Jamie, guys. Uh, says, Cliff, as a coach's son, what is the most important baseball-related lesson uh, your dad taught you and uh, also life lesson that he taught you? How about that? Um, my dad was a high school basketball coach, but he played baseball at UNC Pembroke, so super knowledgeable, and, and coached baseball for a little bit before I was born. Um, I don't know if he gave me one baseball-specific lesson. Uh, a lot of life lessons, some – expensive learning experiences some inexpensive but um, my parents my grandparents it was if you work hard it will guarantee you success it just won't guarantee you success tomorrow and don't make excuses just figure out a way how you can work a little bit harder and over the long haul you'll be successful and the reason i'm sitting in the head coaching chair at one of the best baseball programs in the country is because of those lessons i, I thought it was really cool and relatable when you talked about when you were in school and you were an academic all all american right yeah. and uh you said I didn't enjoy it. I didn't really like it, but I wanted to make my parents proud. And uh, sorry, Mom and Dad, wish I would have done a little <laughs> bit better. But it could certainly relate to that, that sometimes you do things you won't, don't want to do uh, to make folks proud. And uh, I, I thought that was a pretty cool line. Well, I first team meeting of the fall, I asked hey, in the team meeting, how many guys love school? And you can imagine how many hands go up clip. I don't think there's been a hand raised yet. Yeah. And I just look at them and say, that's fine. Uh, I hated school, too, and I was a two-time academic All-American, and that's not for me to sit. But you have to learn how to do things in life that you don't love to do right. because – even in my job, I know your job, there's things that we have to do on a daily basis that's not the fun, most fun part. I know you probably like this part of your job at a very high level. Very much but so. to get to this part, you have to do other stuff. And um, it's the same thing with any job, any profession. And I think that really <laughs> prepares you for life. Reminds me of another statement that Ryan McChrystal made when we talked to him recently about being a catcher. Embrace the suck. <laughs> Embrace the bruises. Embrace the uh, the pains that you go through. And uh, and we'll, I'll tell you what, we'll take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the personnel want to uh, go around the diamond with you coach and talk about your pitchers as well and got the head baseball coach of the pirates cliff godwin joining us talking uh, briefly about the super bowl during the break uh the greatness of patrick mahomes uh, shows up again there coach in overtime chiefs win again uh, what'd you think of the super bowl and and you're in the usher era so what'd you think of the halftime show um i'll go halftime show to start with i thought Usher was better at the end. I thought Ludacris coming in, I was kind of fired up by that. I always get excited about who the surprise <laughs> guests are. Um, um, God, what uh, was that? Little John. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, obviously all that stuff's kind of my era or closer to my era, I guess, clip. So, um, and I, I love Usher. So, um, thought that was solid. Not like the best one ever by any means. I'd probably give it a seven clip out of ten. Okay, yeah, fair score. Um, football, man, what a different Super Bowl. I mean, I think I put down uh, Coach Palumbo had uh, all the staff over and had a sheet to fill out, and he had the total points that you thought was going to be scored. I think I put fifty down, and uh, Easton Daly's girlfriend put down thirty one. I was like, "There's no way." <laughs> and then I'm like, "Jillian, I'm sorry, I gave bad <laughs> advice," um, but. It just goes to show you, man, and when you get in those championship games, obviously the missed extra point, guy hadn't missed an extra point all season, and not to blame the game on him by any means, but those little things are just the difference makers. Um, and obviously there's a lot of plays that happened that were could have gone either way, and um, it was a great game. I mean, it was. I would say it's the best Super Bowl I've ever watched from start to finish. Yeah, fantastic game. Chiefs win again, and that uh, brings the NFL – Season to an end. Time for some baseball and some more pirate hoops. Good to see them get a win. Kim McNeil's team, coach, uh, going through injuries. They are now one game out of first place. Uh, awesome. Got yeah. a little something to, uh, to root for here at the end of the basketball season as we get to pirate baseball beginning on Friday. Um, 
I will. Let's, let's talk about some of the uh, the personnel. Let's, let's start behind the plate. I know how important that position is to you personally. Just look at the coaching staff. You see how important it is uh, for for catchers and and how they make great coaches. But uh, Justin Wilcox and I was thinking about uh, from basketball terms. R.J. Felton. We use the term warrior for him because he plays forty minutes. He goes hard every game. That's uh, I think the baseball equivalent to Wilcox and what he did for this team last year. Just being out there all the time. His performance was great. His hitting but uh what he does with the pitchers now you've got some depth there with mccrystal getting healthy and also uh some young players behind there so when you look at justin wilcoxon do you want to see him maybe out of the lineup more or do you need him with his bat and his leadership and everything well i i can't see him missing a lot of days out of the lineup totally um unless he comes into his mentality that he's tired now we would like to not have to catch him every game which ryan's done a really good job defensively and um has turned that into a strength of his game which when he came to east carolina that was not a strength of his game it was his bat um so ryan has done a really good job to continue to work with coach lartigue and 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 it's a little bit harder for ryan because i mean being a big guy i i tell people like it's harder to catch when you're six foot two than it is when you're five foot nine or ten like walker baron and that's not a knock it's just you got more knees and elbows in the way and to block baseballs and all that good stuff so but walker has really played well and he's swung the bat great and he's uh caught good so we've said this but i mean it has a chance to be the deepest catching position probably i've ever been a part of anywhere i've coached just because the guys are, are really talented and we're hopefully we can you know manage that position a lot better than we were able to do last year where j-dub's not gassed at the end of the season another spot and then i, I want to ask you about the dh but another spot first base where you've got cunningham and clonch and working in some new faces um is filling out your dh game to game one of the toughest things you have to do because you got a ton of options there um i think just putting the lineup down on paper and just having to play nine guys is going to be hard this year and i've spent most of my day today just meeting with guys and talking about you know if we play tomorrow kind of what their role would be and man we we've got a lot of good players and uh i know nobody's going to feel sorry for us that we have a lot of good players but to keep those guys ready to go to come off the bench um cam clonch has played as good as he could play for three weeks i met with him today uh carter cunningham's going to start for us on friday night at first base but clonch is going to play um you know in some capacity he's just um played great defense he's put together tough at bats uh, Chaz myers can can go over there as well Chaz can also um play some second base if we need to spell starling at any point in time um and then Chaz will most likely be our dh uh, on friday night um because he's really swung the bat well and it gives us you know another right hander in the lineup yeah and then we'll move on to second base jacob starling uh has always had the flair for the dramatic on the field and this offseason coach and maybe he's always been this way but talking to him at media day i know he spoke at the banquet uh, i guess I, just, I guess i just haven't heard him talk that much uh but is that part of him maturing and growing you think as a, a player and a person him and j-dub's speech i was sitting over there and probably for the first time i was like a little emotional because i'm thinking about their career as they're talking and I'm like, man, if I'd had to bet money that these guys were going to be able to stand up in front of 600 plus people and articulate a story and like captivate the crowd, I mean, it was amazing. So, yes, uh, Star and J Dub's maturity mentally and just confidence wise has grown so much. But, Star, the thing I've been so happy with him about is he just shows up and works and goes to practice and it's balls to the wall every day to the point. There's been days, which I haven't told him this, he'll laugh if he hears this, but almost to like, a, hey, man, I need you to pull it back a little bit, kind wow. of like a Burleson deal where, hey, Burley, you can't dive in the outfield because we need you to pitch too, so you do not <laughs> dive in practice. Um, but Star has, you know, just worked his tail off, and uh, he's going to have a big year for us. Uh, over to Short, Rick on Facebook says, I would like to hear Coach's thoughts on what Joey Barini has meant to the program. Uh, we went to the same high school, only 47 years apart. So there you go. 47 years <laughs> apart, a little age difference there, but – 
Joey Barini, in my opinion, and, and J-Dub falls in this category, but that's the epitome of East Carolina baseball. You come in, they're walk-ons, they work hard, they buy their time. Joey was a pinch hitter for two years. I've classified him as the best pinch hitter that I've ever coached. I mean, the times that he would come off the bench and just rocket a ball in the left field in the most crucial moments. I'm getting chills, but I can vividly, vividly remember the Carolina game at home that ended up being like a 13-12 game, and he just was a huge spark off the bench and then against Charlotte um, in the regional in 21 and we're down and he comes off the bench. I think it was the first pitch that he saw. It was like 93 and he rockets it in the left field for an RBI to really been thrown into the shortstop position last year and um, he knows this but he had to earn it and there were times where we felt like, God, man, we could you know, maybe upgrade that position and now you look at him this year and he's got more range, his arm's better, he's even more confident it and there's not a question who our starting shortstop is this is joey barini uh how about over at third a new third baseman amac gone dixon williams has had one of those off seasons where we've seen things like this happen in the past you play good in summer ball uh show up in fall i think uh, we were talking about who's the mvp of the fall and and danny and some guys were naming names I believe you texted Danny and said Dixon Williams that was the MVP. Where, well, why aren't you 20, talking? Yeah, he had 20 <laughs> RBIs. I mean, everybody else had like five and six, and Dixon had 20. It's like, hey, man. Just, hey. I think Danny said, everybody's talking about Dixon. I wanted to name another guy. <laughs> yeah. But can that carry over? Coach, are you expecting all that to carry over into the I mean, season? He's had a great preseason. I actually just met with him um, before I came up here, and he's earned the starting third base position. Um, he's played great. Now, as I told him and I told Jake Hunter, um, that hey rents do every day. I tell our team yeah. that because we are deeper than we've ever been. Uh, Kobe Wallace has played good over there. Uh, Nate Crispin can play there. Nate Crispin can play shortstop. He can play second base. Um, he can steal bases. He can play outfield. So we have infield depth. We uh, have a lot of good players. And at any point in time, you could see a lot of different guys out there on the infield. Yeah, I think you said it at media day. We've gone over some names and starters, but but also those other those newcomers and. Back- backups and you said you think you play more guys than just about anybody in the country right like from from game to game i mean look everybody's different but you want guys to be prepared if you know heaven forbid that you have an injury that the guy just steps in and not that he's going to be the same player but you don't miss a beat they're prepared for that and um i think we're as prepared for an injury if we have one that we've ever have been here because of our depth and the maturity of our guys are just showing up and going to work every day so um we're excited to to play somebody differently but i just want our guys to stay selfless which i think they will because this group has been super committed to one another which allows you to be selfless and just really play for the team instead of the uh name on the back of your jersey we'll see uh some new faces and familiar faces in the outfield a familiar one in right field of course with jacob jenkins coward and uh jc has said and and you you it's a, you don't want to hear it, but I uh, respect his maturity. He said he kind of read some of his press clippings last year and uh, and, and might have gotten a little bit too big of a head. Also had an injury we wouldn't wish on our worst enemy, right. and that was a huge factor. He says he's healthy. He says he's, he's way more locked in uh, this year, Coach. So what about J.C.? This will be a, a big year for him. People don't realize it until they go through it, but everybody goes through a little bit of a struggle, and it wasn't like his year was awful. Right. As coaches and guys that were close, we could see he was a tick off, and I appreciate his maturity and, and really understanding that there was a little bit something off but this year he's been super dialed into the team he comes into my office and a lot of times he talks about the team it's nothing about himself and he knows what he needs to do individually to uh be prepared mentally and physically each and every day he's put on more weight he's stronger he's just as fast uh He's got one of the best outfield arms in the country. Um, he, of course, is infectious with his energy. And if, now a swing is back to what I felt like it was his freshman year. And he's, you know, hitting home runs and um, putting together tough at bats like he did his freshman year. How about over at center, Coach? I've heard a lot about Bristol Carter. Can't wait to see him. Is he the, the guy we're going to see there? Well, you know, three weeks ago, um, he would probably have been the guy, and he has not done anything wrong. Just Riley Johnson has yeah. played for three weeks, and he has uh, 
been unbelievable. I mean, I would say that he's had as good a preseason as any player that has ever come through East Carolina's program. He has swung the bat great. He's played great defense. He stole bases. He's been, a, I mean, really a terror on the bases for anybody that's on the opposing team, which has been split squad. So uh, he's going to start in center field on opening day if he's healthy. Now, the thing is, he could be unhealthy at any point in time, and that Riley knows that. Bristol is going to play a lot. And I met with him today, and I said, you haven't done anything wrong. You've done everything that you were supposed to do. We're just really good. And know that you're going to go in. You're one of our best defensive outfielders. we got to lead. You're going into the outfield somewhere. So, um, you know, you could see him in left field, which he's been working out some, um, you know, to go out there for defensive purposes at any point in time. And who uh, who's starting in left for you Friday? Um most likely Luke Nowak. Yeah. Um, so he's done a good job. He's gotten better out there um, in the outfield. And um, the thing is, Bristol is fast, but Bristol's got a hose too. So when you talk about the arm is the least important thing in the outfield, but if you can put yourself in a situation where you got good outfitters that have good arms, then that is a great thing. And, and the, like I said, that's not a knock against Nowak, but sometimes we have different gifts and talents that we have to utilize at a high level. And um, we want to get guys out there as much as possible because, like I said, we want guys to be prepared at the end of the season in case we do have an injury. And, uh, man, going through those names, a lot of speed, Coach. In fact, uh, Ryan McChrystal was so proud of himself because he was telling me about the, what is it, red, the, the speed uh, yeah. determination. Yeah, so tool. red's like you're slow. Yeah. And McChrystal, was he saying he's a gold now? He, uh, yeah, got into that gold category. Really? Did Coach uh, I, I, that was according I, to him. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, Ryan likes to talk a whole lot. Okay. I love Ryan, and I'm going to have to fact check Coach okay. Columba. It might be like gold red. To say he's strictly gold is, in my opinion, a stretch. He was but, so proud of that, too. <laughs> I hope I don't crush his soul, because he's definitely going to listen to this, I'm sure. So, uh, Having said all that, a lot of speed, and then that's uh, that's hell on defenses. Coach. Oh, yeah. So, I, I mean, know you're you, excited about you speed. You look at um, – I mean, Nowak is as good a base stealer as anybody in the country. Riley Johnson's right there. Bristol Carter's right there. Um, Dixon is – healthy now and he's been dealing with the little quad thing but he can still bases so i mean you got a lot of guys up and down the lineup that can really put pressure on that defense of course starling who i just forget about because i know that he's really good at all those things but and i think he was 19 for 20 last year or 18 for 19 so uh can you tell us who will be leading off we're gonna have to wait till friday for that have to wait i feel like i've given more information out today i know i appreciate it so um (laughs) we'll see on friday i've talked to a lot of players so i feel like i can give out a lot of this information appreciate that we'll uh talk some pitching when we return with cliff godwin look at uh the weekend starters and uh, his guys in the bullpen as well east carolina and Ryder coming up on friday at clark leclair stadium to begin the 2024 season four o'clock friday two o'clock on saturday one o'clock on sunday so let's talk uh, some pitching with cliff godwin before we let him get out of here. Uh, appreciate you sitting down for the uh, the preview, Coach. No Always problem. enjoyed the kickoff of season. Good yep. stuff. Um, and we've said so much about Trey Savage at this point. Is there anything that hadn't been said about him? Uh, you're, you know, what, what do you expect from the big righty? Just to be himself, man. It amazes me just his maturity level when it comes to going about his business at the highest level um when your teammates vote you the hardest working pitcher and you're the most talented pitcher on our pitching staff that tells you all you need to know and you can imagine how much that trickles down into the rest of the pitching staff and our players um so as ak said after his start on friday in front of the team trey pitched really good we don't need to talk about that anymore and trey is in just laughing i'm looking at trey he's laughing as ak says that so um he uh, he's special, man. Um, so he will be starting on Friday night. If anybody was wondering, I'm sure that was not uh, a big uh, question out there on social media because they figured that. But how about uh, Saturday? Uh, Zach Root and it yep. said on media day that uh, he felt a ton different from year one to year two. Talking to him uh, at media day a couple weeks ago. How about how he's grown, coach, in, in one year? 
Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, he's just been so much more involved with his teammates and his personalities come out. He's stronger. Of course, the physical part of pitching he's better at, but the mental side of pitching is uh, he is a lot different as well. And he's special, and uh, we want him to be mentally prepared no matter who we're playing. You know, he did that uh, in really big games last year, whether it be closing out the North Carolina game uh, as a freshman or, you know, pitching against the best offense in the country at UVA in the regional championship game. Um, if he has that mindset, which he has to this point, and consistent, and then he has a chance to have a special year for us as well. Well, I'm a guy that does have personality, uh, did I hear Jake Hunter will be throwing on Sunday, yep. the dancing man. Uh, how, how about Jake? He's um, I know uh, really excited about what he's bringing to the table this year pitching-wise. Jake, the dancing man that makes me laugh. Of all the people I thought would be dancing in front of our dugout, I'm not sure I picked him, but uh, <laughs> I like it. I like our guys to have, like I said, personality. Yeah. But Jake's worked hard. Um, his off-speed's a lot better. Uh, he's throwing more strikes. Uh, he's always had the good fastball, but got teams would get to him just because he didn't have a lot of off-speed to go with it, and Coach Knight's worked with him, and his split and his cutter slider is a lot better. Um, but it was extremely competitive. Um, Shink pitched unbelievable. Um, we wanted Shink to stay in the bullpen, and we met with him, AK and I, and just said, hey, man, it's not like you didn't earn the Sunday spot. We just need that depth in the bullpen, especially early on. And Shink was great, man, about it. And um, I looked at him and said, hey, man, if you're not like a trace, I would want to pitch more anyway. Like, you know, you get more opportunities to pitch. Um and he was great. Jaden Winter was great. Um, and we, you know, started him and Chris Kaler on Sundays in the preseason. They both pitched really good. Um, it was a really tough decision, but I felt like Jake was the guy that um, we were going to run out there to start with. And um, Jake knows that he's got to keep working oh, and, and doing all those things because uh, we've got some depth. But it's a good problem to have that you've lined these guys up to be able to start but they're going to be in the bullpen to start with and obviously have midweek games and then as the season goes and ebbs and flows you you understand that there might be a different option that you have in a different starting role so um we're just happy that we've had got some versatility in that bullpen and man when it's such a valuable role especially in college baseball but always has been here at ecu guys eating innings when you think about like a Garrett Saylor and then what Carter Spivey was able to do, be pitcher of the year as a bullpen guy, right? So um, how do you – what's your philosophy on the midweek games, Coach? Do you want a fourth starter to try to give you five or six, or do you go into those knowing let's get two awesome innings from a bunch of different guys? Yeah. Well, I think this team, we, we probably could have a four starter. Um, I think we're going to play every game as a separate entity on that opening weekend and see what we have available. But we're also open to just having, uh, I mean, I don't really like the term opener. I'm more of like closing out innings. I like the closer role of, hey, let's go close out the first inning um, and matchups and all that good stuff. So um, we're not opposed. I mean, like Sailor evolved last year into being that midweek starter and end up being, in my opinion, one of our best starting pitchers down the stretch. I mean, the way he pitched at the conference tournament against South Florida and that start that he had and then, you know, starting against UVA in the game, that the first game we played him and pitched yeah. well, um, I think for five innings. So, we're not opposed to it, but we're just going to take it one game at a time and kind of see how the season goes. I loved uh, talking to Coach Knight about the philosophy on a closer and, and, and how it's different than the big leagues. He said, sometimes you need your best pitcher in when it's second and third in the sixth inning. Why would you not put in your guy to get out of that scenario and uh, that's the the philosophy right and that's why you'll see sometimes danny come in in the sixth sometimes in the ninth wide in the seventh you'll whatever the situation uh, arises you'll be ready for it no matter who the guy is what inning it is well that's the, been the philosophy since i was hired here i mean even when we had joe engel back in 15 16 it was you got to bring your guy in when the game can be won or lost and, and i think analytically people don't that maybe don't I don't want to say that I'm smarter than everybody else, but don't understand the game. But it affects your offense, too, like the momentum. So if you blow the lead in the sixth inning or seventh inning, can you do what you would do offensively with the score being now we're down two runs instead of the game's tied or we're up a run? Um, and God forbid that you give up like a really big inning and now you're down five runs. Well, hey, you didn't bring your closer in. Well, he ain't pitching today because hey, – There's no you, point to bring no, him in now. no <laughs> point to bring him in now. So um, we're big believers, and, and it's really those crucial moments in the game where you feel like, man, this 
this is going to be the make or break of this game, the way this game's flowing. So we need to make sure we put our guy in that gives us the best opportunity to minimize this jam that we're in. That's a great and, – and you guys look at, at charts and ad nauseum, I'm sure, but there is a big difference from what a chart says to what you're feeling in this moment right now. And as a manager, as a coach, you've got to decide what's the best for the team in that uh, that certain situation. Yep. Um, I've always been under the philosophy, which you guys know this, but uh, you can never take them out too early, but you can take them out too late. <laughs> that's for sure. And um, that's not a knock against who's on the mound. But right. um, if you've got somebody down there that's got good stuff and you feel like this other guy's tired, even though the matchups have been good to that point, it's normally, in my opinion, a little bit better to bring somebody else in because they hadn't seen him before. You mentioned uh, Kaler, who is a veteran. I uh, hadn't talked about Norby. Will we see a, a Norby on the mound for the Pirates this you year? You will see a Norby on the mound. When? I, I don't I don't have the crystal ball. Um, you'll see a Norby. You'll see an Eric Ritchie. Um, Corey Costello's been coming along. Um, I think he's continued to grow confident, confidence-wise, and he's got really good stuff. I mean, D'Lo has – look like hey man he's a possible guy that hey you got a three run lead that he could go out there and close out that ninth inning um, he's acting differently more confidently uh, Drew Bryan has had a little bit of a, uh, intercostal um, muscle strain but he's supposed to get off the mound tomorrow uh, he's feeling better so he's another option out of the bullpen so uh, we feel like right now we're we're deep in the bullpen and, and we've got a lot of good options and uh, finally coach have not mentioned Parker Bird and and, and what a great story what a great inspiration when he starts hitting liners in the right field the story changes like it's uh he is getting it done getting some ab's he told us last week just how awesome it was to be up there and get a quab uh, the quality of bat and uh well we see parker in the in the box at some point this year Parker Bird will get in a bat this year. I wish I could tell all Pirate Nation, hey, it's going to happen this game. Right. Hey, this date, this time, this inning. I can't tell you that. So I guess everybody just needs to come to Clark LeClaire every single game. And you're going to see Parker Bird at some point in time. <laughs> and uh, folks will go to Clark McClare every single game because they are fired up about this team this season. And, uh, Coach, another way uh, that folks can get involved and help out the team is the 23 Club. We had uh, your old teammate Mike Harrington, who I knew back in the day. He could tell you how bad of a ball player I was <laughs> if you really want to hear that, Coach. Uh, but Mike and uh, some other guys have started the 23 Club NIL opportunities for players on this baseball team. Guys, uh, I believe that you'll say – have earned it right uh, so tell us about the 23 club yes yeah, so it really kind of came about um there was a lot of conversations going on between um you know mike harrington and the team boneyard people and then i was actually on the other side talking to some mentors like mike a man do we need to start our own collective and team boneyard has been super gracious to us that we're still underneath their umbrella but we have our own website and that's really where mike uh, Harrington came in and Hank Hinton helped us out with that of just developing this website so that um, when we're sending it to just a baseball alums like that you're sending the link to the website um, to them and you can do monthly donations you can do a one time thing but the way that you know we want to do it within our program is the guys that have been in our program um, we're able to help them we don't have everyone on scholarship and we only have 11.7 scholarships to spread out over 32 players which we have 40 players on our team so you have guys like joey barini who's never received athletic aid from east carolina mm -hmm. um he has been able to get a little bit of nil stuff this year which has been awesome he deserves everything but if we could get to a point which this is really shooting for the stars but where everybody just didn't have to pay anything to come to school at east carolina then man we're, we're talking our guys are not getting rich they're not going to drive range rovers right. because of nil but if we could help you know, just knock down the cost of school for their families. Like a, a guy like Jacob Starling, his mom was working two jobs up until this year just to allow him to come to East Carolina on a partial scholarship out of state. And and now I think she's only got to work one job. So that's been a really cool story. I, feel, I mean, it's kind of what the NIL was designed to do in a perfect world almost instead of... The, that's what it was designed to do. Exactly. But now it's pay for play and cheat. Right. And, uh, you know, 
pay players to recruit them, which you're not supposed to do, but nobody can uh, really police it. The NCAA just says, uh, we're going to keep our hands off. And I know that some schools have gotten in trouble recently, Tennessee and stuff. I'm just interested to see what their penalties are going right. to be. <laughs> uh, there's a topic for uh, the offseason, Coach. That's we'll right. Get you hey, back in there. Yeah, I, I'm not going to worry about NIL a whole lot during the season. <laughs> uh, one final question from Tyler. He says, Cliff, have you watched Chandler and Cliff play basketball? I have not. I didn't even know that was a thing. Well, let me show you just uh, one highlight of it real quick. And, yes, I did pull this highlight for a reason. We played one-on-one last week, Coach. Here's Chandler going to the basket. No good. And then describe what you're about to see right here, Coach. I'm, I'm taking it well, out. first off, I like the hat backwards. You really look Well, how like, much do you like that? Oh, my God. I how mean, much that, do you that, like that? That's... I mean, first off, Chandler's got no respect for him. I mean, just he's got 10 feet between you and him. And, I mean, you look like a pro right now. All right, and we're cutting the rest of the game. Hey, you just – you didn't even hit rim there. I don't need a rim, Coach. Just give me a net. (laughs) Cliff, we are out of time. Thank you for hanging out, man. Good luck, and uh, we'll see you out at Clark and Clare Stadium. All right, thanks for having me, Cliff. Yes, sir. You got it. There is Cliff Goblin.